Oop. And welcome to Reedwood for this special time of Christmas Eve service. As uh, people uh, shuffle in, we just want to uh, remind you that uh, we will be lighting these candles and to make sure that everyone has one of these candles uh, to light as we sing our final song for this evening. So uh, this morning I read a, uh, a poem by Howard Thurman as we lit the uh, Advent candles. And I came across another Howard Thurman Christmas poem. I'm not sure, well, I'm sure that uh, there's some sort of algorithm that's, that's following me because I usually f find it on Facebook, and, uh, but they're very appropriate. And I thought that I would go ahead and read this uh, Christmas poem by Howard Thurman. Thurman writes this, the title of this is Christmas is a Season of the Heart. The time of forgiveness for injuries past, the sacrament of sharing without, balance, without balancing the deed, the moment of remembrance of graces forgotten, the poem of joy making light the spirit, the sense of renewal restoring the soul, the day of thanksgiving for the goodness of God. Christmas is the season of the heart. I thought that that would be, that was an appropriate just meditation, an opening meditation as we have gathered closely here together. It's good to see. And as we prepare our hearts and as we prepare our minds for song, and this time of togetherness. Let's go ahead and take a moment to center, and I'll open us up with a few words of prayer. Let's center down, friends. Loving God, we want to be present in the moment, and we're all excited and have uh, just a sense of anticipation, a sense of joy, a sense of togetherness as we have gathered in this space. And we thank you that you are present in this space. And we pray that uh, the words of Christmas, the prayers of Christmas, the, the songs of Christmas would indeed, according to uh, the poem be uh, a substance of the heart and a word to the heart that refreshes us and reunites us to you and to one another. We ask your blessing upon this time and that our hearts and minds would be open to your ever-present heart and mind. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, friends, again, welcome to Reedwood, and uh, we're just looking forward to this time of song and joy.
In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and Mary gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Have some light, please. <laughs> Let there be light. Jesse's lineage 
Friends, we now invite you to stand and sing with us, O Come All Ye Faithful. The Christmas Miracle of Jonathan Toomey by Susan Wojciechowski. The village children called him Mr. Gloomy, but in fact his name was Toomey, Mr. Jonathan Toomey. And though it's not kind to call people names, this one fit quite well. For Jonathan Toomey never smiled, never laughed, he went about mumbling and grumbling, muttering and sputtering, grumping and griping. He complained that the church bells rang too often, that the birds sang too shrilly, and that the children played too loudly. Mr. Toomey was a woodcarver. Some said he was the best woodcarver in the whole valley. He spent his days sitting at his workbench carving beautiful shapes from blocks of pine hickory, chestnut wood. And after supper, he sat in a straight back chair near the fireplace, smoking his pipe, staring into the flames. Jonathan Toomey was not an old man, but if you saw him, you might think he was, the way he walked, bent forward with his head down. You wouldn't notice his eyes, the clear blue of an August sky, and you would not see the dimple on his chin since his face was mostly hidden under a shaggy, untrimmed beard, speckled with sawdust and wood shavings, 
and with crumbs of bread or a bit of potato or dried gravy. The village people did not know it, but there was a reason for his gloom, a reason for his grumbling, a reason why he walked hunched over as if carrying a great weight on his shoulders. Some years earlier, when Jonathan Toomey was young and full of life and full of love, his wife and baby had become very sick. And because those were the days before hospitals and medicines and skilled doctors, his wife and baby died three days apart from each other. So Jonathan Toomey had packed his belongings into a wagon and traveled until his tears stopped. He settled into a tiny house at the edge of a village to do his wood carving. One day in early December, there was a knock at Jonathan's door. Mumbling and grumbling, he went to answer it, and there stood a woman and a young boy. I'm the widow McDowell. I'm new in your village, and this is my son Thomas, the woman said. I'm seven, and I know how to whistle, said Thomas. Whistling is pish posh, said the woodcarver gruffly. I need something carving, said the woman, and she told Jonathan about a very special set of Christmas figures her grandfather had carved for her when she was a girl. After I moved here, she said, I discovered they were lost. I had hoped that by some miracle I would find them again, but it hasn't happened. There's no such thing as miracles, the woodcarver told her. Now, could you describe these figures for me? There were sheep, she said. Two of them with curly wool, said Thomas. Yes, two, said the widow, and a cow, an angel, Mary, Joseph, the baby Jesus, and the wise men. Three of them, added Thomas. Will you take the job? I will. I'm grateful. How soon can you have them done? They will be ready when they are ready. But I must have them by Christmas. They mean so very much to me. I can't remember a Christmas without them. Christmas is pish posh, Jonathan said gruffly, and he shut the door. The following week, there was a knock at the woodcarver's door. Muttering, sputtering, he went to answer it, and there stood the widow, Gal, and Thomas. Excuse me, said the widow, but Thomas has been begging to come and watch you work. He says he wants to be a woodcarver when he grows up and what would like to watch you since you're the best in the valley. I'll be quiet. You won't even know I'm here. Please, please, piped in Thomas. With a grumble, the woodcarver stepped aside to let them in. He pointed to a stool near his workbench and said, no talking, no jiggling, no noise, he ordered Thomas. The widow McDowell handed Mr. Toomey a warm loaf of cornbread as a token of thanks. Then she took out her knitting and sat down in a rocking chair in the far corner of the cottage. Not there, bellowed the woodcarver. No one sits in that chair. So she moved to the straight back chair by the fire. Thomas sat very still. Once, when he had to sneeze, he pressed a finger under his nose to hold it back. Once, when he wanted desperately to scratch his leg, he counted to 20 to keep his mind off the itch. After a very long time, Thomas cleared his throat <clears throat> and whispered, Mr. Toomey? May I ask a question? The woodcarver glared at Thomas, then shrugged his shoulders and grunted. Thomas decided that meant yes. So he went on, is that my sheep you're carving? The woodcarver nodded and grunted again. After another very long time, Thomas whispered, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, but you're carving my sheep wrong. The widow McDowell's knitting needle stopped clicking. Jonathan Toomey's knife stopped carving. 
Thomas went on. It's a beautiful sheep, nice and curly. But my sheep looked happy. That's pish posh. Sheep are sheep. They cannot look happy. Mine did. They knew they were with the baby Jesus, so they were happy. After that, Thomas was quiet for the rest of the afternoon. When the church bells chimed six, Mr. Toomey grumbled under his breath about the awful noise. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas sneezed three times, then thanked the woodcarver for allowing him to watch. That evening, after a supper of cornbread and boiled potatoes, the woodcarver sat down at his bench. He picked up his knife, he picked up the sheep, and he worked until his eyelids drooped shut. A few days later, there was a knock at the woodcarver's door. Griping and grumbling, he went to answer it. And there stood the widow and her son. May I watch again? I will be quiet, said Thomas. He settled himself on the stool very quietly while his mother laid a basket of sweet-smelling sweet raisin buns on the table. The teapot is still warm, Mr. Toomey said gruffly, his head bent over his work. While Mr. Toomey carved, the widow McDowell poured tea. She touched the wood carver gently on the shoulder and placed a cup of tea and a bun next to him. He pretended not to notice, but soon both the plate and the cup were empty. Thomas tried to eat the bun his mother had given him as quietly as he could, but it's almost impossible to be seven and eat a warm, sticky raisin bun without making various smacking, licking, satisfied noises. When Thomas had finished, he tried to sit quietly. Once, he almost hiccuped but he took a deep breath and held it till his face turned red. And once, without thinking, he began to swing his legs, but a glare from the woodcarver stopped him and he kept them so still they fell asleep. After a very long time, Thomas whispered, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, may I ask a question? Grunt. Is that my cow you're carving? Nod and grunt. Another very long time went by. Then Thomas cleared his throat and said, <clears throat> Mr. Toomey, excuse me, but I must tell you something. That's a beautiful cow, the most beautiful cow I've ever seen, but it's not right. My cow looked proud. That's pish posh, growled the wood carver. Cows are cows. They cannot look proud. My cow did. It knew that Jesus chose to be born in its barn, so it was proud. Thomas was quiet for the rest of the afternoon. The only sounds that could be heard were the scraping of the carving knife, the humming of the widow McDowell, and the click, click of her knitting needles. When the church bells chimed six, Mr. Toomey muttered under his breath about the noise. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas shook first one leg and then the other. He thanked the woodcarver for allowing him to watch. That evening, after a supper of boiled potatoes and raisin buns, the woodcarver sat down at his bench. He picked up his carving knife. He picked up the cow. He worked until his eyelids drooped shut. A few days later, there was a knock on the woodcarver's door. He smoothed down his hair as he went to answer it. And at the door were the widow and her son. May I watch again? As Mrs. McDowell warmed the tea and put a plate of fresh molasses cookies on the workbench, Thomas watched the woodcarver work on the figure of an angel. After a very long time, Thomas spoke, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, is that my angel you're carving? 
Yes. And would you do me the favor of telling me exactly what I'm doing wrong? Well, my angel looked like one of God's most important angels because it was sent to baby Jesus. And just how does one make an angel look important? Oh, you'll be able to do it. You're the best woodcarver in the valley. After another very long time, Thomas spoke. Mr. Toomey, excuse me. May I ask a question? Do you ever stop talking? My mother says I don't. She says I should learn about the virtue of silence from you. Under his beard, the woodcarver's face turned pink. The widow McDowell's face turned as red as the scarf she was knitting. Well, speak up. What's your question? Will you please teach me to carve? I'm a very busy man, grumbled the woodcarver. But he put down the important angel. You will carve a bird. A robin, I hope. I like robins. With a piece of charcoal, the woodcarver sketched a robin on a piece of brown paper. He handed Thomas a small block of pine and a knife. He showed him how to lop the corners from the block and slowly smooth the edges of the wood into curves. Thomas copied the woodcarver's strokes, head bent, tongue working from side to side of his lower lip as he concentrated. When the church bells chimed six, Jonathan Toomey was holding Thomas's hand in his, guiding the knife along the edge of a wing. He didn't hear the bells ringing. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas brushed wood shavings from his shirt. Then he reached out and brushed two especially large pieces of wood shaving from Jonathan Toomey's beard. He thanked the woodcarver for teaching him how to carve. Later, after a supper of boiled potatoes and molasses cookies, Jonathan Toomey went to the workbench. He thought for a long time. He sketched drawing after drawing, and finally he picked up his carving knife. He picked up the angel. He carved until his eyelids drooped shut. A few days later, there was a knock on the woodcarver's door. Mr. Toomey jumped up to answer it. There stood the widow McDowell with a bouquet of pine boughs and holly sprigs dotted with berries. And there stood Thomas clutching his partly carved robin. While Thomas and Mr. Toomey carved, Mrs. McDowell put the bouquet in a jar of water. She scrubbed Mr. Toomey's kitchen table and set the jar in the center on a pretty cloth embroidered with lilies of the valley and daisies, which she found in a drawer below the, car the cupboard. The woodcarver said to Thomas, next I will carve the wise men and Joseph. Perhaps before I begin, you will tell me about all the mistakes I'm going to make. Well, said Thomas, my wise men were wearing their most wonderful robes because they were going to visit Jesus, and my Joseph was leaning over baby Jesus like he was protecting him. He looked very serious. It wasn't until the church bells had chimed and the widow and her son were preparing to go that Mr. Toomey saw the jar of pine boughs and the scrubbed table and the cloth embroidered with lilies of the valley and daisies. I found the cloth in a drawer. I thought it would look pretty on the table, the widow McDowell said, smiling. Never open that drawer, the woodcarver said harshly. When the two had left, Jonathan put the cloth away. That evening, after a supper of boiled potatoes, the woodcarver worked on Joseph and the wise men until his eyes drooped shut. A few days later, there was a knock on the woodcarver's door. He dusted the crumbs from his beard, brushed the sawdust from his shirt. 
and at the door were the widow McDowell and Thomas. All afternoon, Thomas watched the woodcarver work. When it was time to leave, Jonathan said to Thomas, I'm about to begin the last two figures, Mary and the baby. Can you tell me how your figures looked? Oh, they were the most special of all. Jesus was smiling and reaching up to his mother, and Mary looked like she loved him very much. Thank you, Thomas, said the woodcarver. And the widow McDowell said, Tomorrow is Christmas. Is there any chance the figures will be ready? They will be ready when they are ready. I understand, said the widow. And she handed Jonathan two packages. Merry Christmas, she said. Jonathan folded his arms across his chest. I want no presents, he said harshly. Well, that's exactly why we are giving them, answered the widow. She put them down on the table and left. Jonathan sat down at the table. Slowly, he opened the first package. Inside was a red scarf, hand-knit, warm, bright. He tied the scarf around his neck. The other package held a robin crudely carved of pine. A smile twitched at the corners of Jonathan's mouth as he ran his fingers over the lopsided wings. He dusted the fireplace mantle with his sleeve and placed the robin exactly in the center so he could look at it from his chair. The woodcarver did not eat supper that day. Instead, he began to sketch the final figures. Mary and Jesus. He drew Mary, then wadded the sketch into a ball and tossed it on the floor. He drew the baby, wadded the sketch into a ball and tossed it with the first. He sketched again. Once more, he crumpled the paper. Soon there was a small mountain of crumpled papers at his feet. He picked up a block of wood and tried to carve, but his knife would not do what he wanted it to do. He hurled the chunk of wood into the fireplace and sat staring into the flames. When he heard the church bells announcing the midnight service, he got up. Slowly, he opened the drawer beneath the cupboard, the drawer he had told the widow never to open. From it, he took the cloth embroidered with lilies of the valley and daisies. He took out a rough woolen shawl and a lace handkerchief. He took out a tiny white baby blanket and a little pair of blue socks. He placed each piece gently on the floor. And from the bottom of the drawer, he lifted out a picture frame beautifully carved of deep brown chestnut wood. In the frame was a charcoal sketch of a woman sitting in a rocking chair holding a baby. The baby's arms were reaching up, touching the woman's face. The woman was looking down at the baby, smiling. Jonathan sat down in his rocking chair and held the picture against his chest. He rocked slowly, his eyes closed. Two tears trailed into his beard. When he finally took the picture to his workbench and began to carve, his fingers worked quickly and surely. He carved all through the night. The next day, there was a knock on the widow McDowell's door. When she opened it, there stood the woodcarver, his neck wrapped in a red scarf, holding a wooden box with straw. Mr. Toomey, said the, window, the widow, what a surprise. Merry Christmas. The figures are ready, he said, as he stepped inside. From the box, Jonathan unpacked two curly sheep, happy sheep, 
because they were with Jesus. He unpacked a proud cow and an angel, a very important angel with mighty wings stretching from its shoulders right down to the hem of its gown. He unpacked three wise men wearing their most wonderful robes, edged with fur and falling in rich folds. He unpacked a serious and caring Joseph. He unpacked Mary wearing a rough woolen shawl, looking down, loving her precious baby son. Jesus was smiling and reaching up to touch his mother's face. That day, Jonathan went to the Christmas service with the widow McDowell and Thomas. And that day, in the churchyard, the village children saw Jonathan throw back his head, showing his eyes as clear as an August sky, and laughing. No one ever called him Mr. Gloomy again. In just a minute, we're going to sing four Christmas hymns. It's a wonderful feeling to know that across the world, people are singing these hymns also with us. And many of these hymns were penned in the 18th and 19th century by people who had a, a special view of Christ's birth. One of these hymns old little town of Bethlehem is pinned by a priest named Brooks who visited Bethlehem in 1865. And he was so moved that he wrote this poem in 1868 and then the organist of his church, Episcopal Church, put it to music and it's been sung ever since. It's a bit sad that even today, Bethlehem could not celebrate because of war. That makes me sad. The other hymns we're going to be singing is Angels We Have Heard on High, Joy to the World, who was penned by Isaac Watts in 1718. This is hard to believe, but he penned 750 hymns. And this is one of his most famous, Joy to the World. You've, you recognize others that we have sung. Uh, when I Survey the Wondrous Cross is by Isaac Watts. And then Silent Night, We're Gonna Finish, was penned in 1818. And it is one of the most famous of the Christmas hymns sung by most churches. And um, as the story goes, even during war, one of the world wars, the Germans and the Allied forces stopped war to sing that song. And they actually competed, in my reading, they competed with one another who knew the most verses and the most songs. That's the kind of war that I like, actually. So now we're going to be led by Shirley in the first three, and then I will start the candle lighting on the second, third, fourth, I guess the fourth, Silent Night.
We have traveled tonight on the road to Bethlehem to the child whose birth was proclaimed by the prophets, proclaimed by the angels, welcomed by the shepherds. We have felt the presence of that light tonight as we have shared our gifts, as we have joined our voices and our hearts in song, as we have listened to the power of story and the beauty of candlelight. And we pray that the light of Christ will shine in our dark world, especially in the darkest of places, the place of your very birth. May we who have felt that light in our hearts, may we share that light with the world, with the world in all of its beauty and its pain. Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas. Amen. Go in peace and joy. Thank you for the story. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You always inspire me. Hey, David, it's so good to see you. Yeah, how are you doing? And this is Jack. I, gosh, last time I saw him, he was a baby. He's not a baby anymore. I know, they grow up way too fast. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Luke's not here tonight. He was, he's down in California. We, uh, he doesn't live there. He's just there for Christmas with his wife's family. Yeah. Be sure to tell Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's busy kayaking. And that's that's his bit. Yeah, he has his business, which is really fun. You should do. Yeah, Nestecada, Nestecada, right here. Yeah, yeah. Go around, go teleporting or kayaking. Yeah, yeah. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Good. Good, good. 